Welcome back. Thanks very much for staying with us. You're watching Beyond World is One with me, Raisha Segal, and this is Speed News. We'll get you the latest from all across the globe in just a matter of 30 odd minutes. Let's get you started. Amid the growing outcry over the rape and murder of a trainee doctor in India's West Bengal, 71 Padma Wadi doctors have written to Prime Minister Modi seeking his immediate intervention in the case. In the letter, the doctors highlighted the growing cases of violence against healthcare workers in India, especially women and girls. And they've also urged the central as well as the state governments to enact and implement a different law for their protection. With doctors demanding a central law that protects healthcare workers following the rape and murder of a trainee doctor in India's West Bengal, resident doctors at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences or AIMS Delhi have announced that they would continue their strike demanding an, demanding an ordinance. The RDA has announced that the doctors will be providing elective OPD services outside the Union Health Ministry in Delhi. Pan India demonstrations continue as marches and candlelight vigils are being held across multiple locations as a sign of sympathy towards the trainee doctor who was found dead at the Kolkata based RJ Kar Medical Hall College and Hospital. The parents of the victim have alleged conspiracy now. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has taken sua motor cognizance of the case. A three judge bench led by Chief Justice of India will hear the matter on Tuesday. One person was killed after a bomb exploded in Tel Aviv. This as U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in the city in a renewed bid to seal a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas. A senior Israeli police officer said that they were probing an explosion in Tel Aviv as a possible terror attack. An unidentified man died in the blast after a bomb he was carrying in his bag went off. The attack came as Israel continued to pound the Gaza Strip. Gaza health authorities claim the Israeli strikes across Gaza have led to 24 deaths over the weekend, including a woman and her six children who died in the blast. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Tel Aviv. This is his ninth trip to West Asia since the Gaza war began last year. He's all set to meet Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and several other top Israeli leaders. Blinken will also travel to Cairo on Tuesday where ceasefire talks will resume. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden said that a Gaza ceasefire is still possible despite Israel and Hamas accusing each other of sabotaging the peace talks. Vice President and now Democratic presidential contestant Kamala Harris also called for a Gaza ceasefire deal during a campaign trip to Pennsylvania. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has accused Hamas of sabotaging truce talks and peace talks. 
The Israeli Prime Minister made this remark during a cabinet meeting in Jerusalem. Hamas, on the other hand, has accused Netanyahu of obstructing an agreement for a truce and hostage exchange in Gaza. Hamas has called the new proposal for a ceasefire deal too close to Netanyahu's recent positions, raising doubts over the success of peace talks in Cairo. Ukraine has destroyed a key bridge in Russia's Kursk region and struck a second one nearby on Sunday. Russian telegram channels claimed a second bridge over the same river in the village of Zwanoi had been struck. According to Russia's MASH news site, the attacks left the area with just one intact bridge, which meant that the Ukrainian strikes would further complicate Moscow's attempts to recharge its forces in Kursk and evacuate the civilians from the area. The strikes on the bridges are apparently aimed at blocking a Russian counter push in Kursk. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has urged Kiev's allies to lift the remaining restrictions on using Western weapons to uh, strike deeper targets in Russia. Russia's foreign ministry, on the other hand, has alleged that U.S.-made HIMARS launchers were used to destroy bridges on the same river. Meanwhile, the head of the U.N. nuclear watchdog, General Rafael Grossi, said that the safety situation at the Russian-occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is worsening, following reports from its team of a nearby drone strike. Kiev and Moscow, meanwhile, have traded blame for a string of attacks in the vicinity of the power plant. <laughs> Moscow has shot down media reports of indirect talks with Kiev in the wake of Ukraine's Kursk offensive. According to these reports, Ukraine and Russia were set to send delegations to Qatar in a bid to negotiate an agreement halting strikes in energy and power infrastructure on both the warring sides. However, Russia has denied all these claims. Chinese and Philippines vessels collided during a confrontation near a disputed shoal in the South China Sea. China's Coast Guard said a Philippine vessel had ignored its repeated warnings and had purposely collided with a Chinese vessel in an unprofessional and dangerous manner. And countering these claims by China, the Philippine government has said that two of its Coast Guard ships were damaged in collisions with the Chinese vessels that were conducting unlawful and aggressive maneuvers. China and the Philippines have had repeated confrontations in the vital waterway in recent months. Pai Tong Tan Shinavatra has become Thailand's youngest ever Prime Minister. The 37-year-old was sworn in on Sunday after she accepted the King's command to form a government. Pai Tong Tan Shinavatra was royally endorsed as the nation's new Prime Minister. Days after Srita Thavasan was dismissed as the Prime Minister by the Constitutional Court of Thailand. Pai Tong Tan won by nearly two-thirds in a House of Representatives vote last week. And the newly elected leader says that she will continue the policies of her predecessor Srita, which includes economic stimulus and reforms and also tackling illegal drugs and improving the country's universal health care system. Prime Minister Narendra Modi will embark on a historic one-day visit to Poland on August 21st. This marks the first visit by an Indian PM to the country in 40 years. Apart from meeting Polish President Andrzej Duda and Prime Minister Donald Tusk, Prime Minister Modi will also pay tribute to the Indian soldiers who fought alongside Polish soldiers during World War II.
India's Defence Minister Rajnath Singh will meet US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin on August 23rd at the Pentagon. In what is due to be the first US visit of a high-ranking cabinet minister of Modi 3.0 government. The two leaders are expected to discuss a wide range of bilateral and regional issues as well as ways to strengthen ties between the world's two largest democracies. Singh will leave for a five-day trip to the U.S. beginning August 21st. Sri Lanka is getting ready for its high-octane presidential polls, the first after the country plunged into an unprecedented economic crisis. It's also for the first time that 39 contestants are vying for the top job, though the competition is likely to narrow down to just four which includes incumbent Ranil Vikramasinghe and leader of opposition Sajit Premadasa. As the battle for the presidential race gets intense, some of the prominent contestants have already hit the campaign trail. They plan to hold as many as 100 rallies each across the country ahead of the polls. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris is heading into the Democratic National Convention riding a historic whirlwind. Harris's campaign has broken records for fundraising, packed arenas with supporters and they've turned the polls in some crucial battleground states in the Dems' favor. However, experts say that Harris's initial surge will wear off, leaving simmering divisions among Democrats on various issues like the economy, and Israel Hamas war, along with the fierce battle against Republican contestant Donald Trump. The Democratic Party is hoping to ride the new wave of enthusiasm to victory and make Harris the nation's first female president. Japan's national and Tokyo governments are seeking a $4.7 billion valuation for Tokyo Metro. The government is reportedly preparing to list the subway as early as October end. This would be the nation's biggest IPO in roughly six years. The two governments, which own 100% of Tokyo Metro, they plan to arrange a meeting of brokerages within a week for a briefing on the IPO. The company, whose business includes real estate and retail, reported a jump in net profit by two-thirds to 46 billion yen. Chinese copper exports dropped last month from an all-time high. Domestic buyers are taking advantage of the metal's rapid retreat in prices. Exports of copper and other goods fell 40% from June. Still, that's nearly double the level of the previous year. Outbound shipments over the first seven months were 43% higher than in 2023. A further drop in exports is likely as demand conditions improve in China. Experts at Macquarie said that the Australian corporate earnings have seen a positive surprise amid investor euphoria over estimate defeating margins. But historical trends suggest that results could take a turn as the earnings season approaches its end. It added that companies had posted better than expected margins, often supported by lower tax and interest costs, with most of them outperforming market views so far this season. The US dollar declined broadly on Monday and slid against the yen in particular as investors bet on a dovish tone emerging in the Federal Reserve's July policy meeting and also the minutes of Jerome Powell's upcoming speech at Jackson Hole. The minutes due on Wednesday and Powell's speech on Friday are likely to be the main drivers of currency and markets this week. Firefighters in Turkey are racing against time to contain the raging wildfires in the western part of the region. The blaze in Turkey's 
Kasiaka district was caused by a fire built by three people picnic near an area of the forest. The blaze, which was fanned by strong winds, came close to residential areas on Friday. Turkey's interior ministry said that over 900 residents have been evacuated from five districts in the region. So far, the fire has damaged 16 buildings and affected 78 people. Turkish Health Ministry says 29 people are admitted in the hospital. A total of 53 aerial vehicles consisting 42 helicopters and 11 airplanes, 366 ground vehicles have been deployed to douse the fire. Air New New Zealand has become the first major airline to abandon its 2030 climate goal, citing challenges in fleet upgrades and the high cost of other jet fuels. The airline, which had pledged to reduce its carbon intensity by 28.9% from 2019 levels, announced that global supply chain delays and affordability issues with fuel-efficient aircraft have made the target unachievable. The air carrier explained that the potential delays in receiving new aircraft that also forced the airline to reconsider its near-term climate commitments. Despite this setback, Air New Zealand said it remains committed to its long-term goal of achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Pro-Russia websites posing as American news outlets are spreading baseless claims that Democrats, they conspired to assassinate Donald Trump. These fake sites, made possible by inexpensive and widely accessible AI tools, are driving the spread of divisive and false stories. U.S. officials have warned that foreign powers like Russia and Iran, they are ramping up efforts to interfere in the upcoming November 5th elections. Experts say such fake news websites have become a prime example of how AI-powered platforms are spreading misinformation during a very important election year for the U.S. According to a report, in the past five years, over 1,400 ambulances have been dispatched to Amazon's UK warehouses with 161 and 125 call outs at Duna Mifline, a third of calls were due to chest pains while others involved seizures and strokes suicide attempts and serious mental health cases were also reported at sites like Bolton and London other incidents included pregnancy complications traumatic injuries and chemical exposure at various locations OpenAI has shut down accounts belonging to an Iranian group accused of using chat GPT to influence the U.S. presidential polls and other global issues. The group known as Storm 2035 reportedly used the chatbot to create content which are related to U.S. election contestants. Not only that, but also the Gaza war and Israel's presence in the, uh, at the Paris Games, which just concluded. They then posted on social media and websites. According to OpenAI's investigation, the group primarily produced long articles and short social media posts using ChatGPT. However, OpenAI's probe also found that the operation gained very little online traction. A couple from the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh lost around $360,000 or 3 crore rupees in a cyber scam. The couple claimed that they were tricked by a fake investment scheme promoted through a Facebook ad. After showing interest in the ad, they were added to a WhatsApp group which was run by a recognized investment platform. One of the victims... Nabanita Mishra said that she could view her investment and supposed profits on the company's app but could not withdraw any money. 